Welcome to Vermont Today. I'm Terry Gerolliman, and my guest this month is uh, Anthony Polina. Anthony is running for uh, governor of Vermont. Um, Anthony, during the Dean administration, you worked on campaign finance reform. What are the prospects for campaign finance reform now? And as governor, what will you do in this area? Well, first of all, I am a big believer in increasing participation in the political process and getting more people involved. And right now, money plays a bigger role than it ever has before, both in Vermont and around the country. And I think, frankly, that turns people off. And it means that special interests have uh, more power over our policymakers and our campaigns, frankly, than most people would like to believe. Now, as a progressive candidate, I don't take corporate money. Um, I'm not going to get a lot of money from poli national political parties, and that, you know, not going to use that kind of uh, special interest financing. In Vermont, what I was able to do a number of years ago was form a coalition of a whole range of organizations from seniors to environmental groups to consumer groups and others. And we were successful in passing very comprehensive campaign finance reforms in Vermont, which would have reduced the amount of money people can spend on elections and reduced the amount of money people can give to candidates. Um, and that was taken through the courts, and a lot of that was taken away. They said it was a violation of our free speech rights. That money is speech, and if you limit how much money I can spend, then you're limiting my speech, which means that millionaires obviously get to speak a lot more than working people do. Just the other day, well, not the other day, but recently, a couple weeks ago, our governor um, vetoed a piece of campaign finance reform legislation the most important part of it was that it would have limited how much money a candidate could take from a political party. National political parties act as these funnels. I, I kind of call them money laundering machines because what happens is special interest, the pharmaceutical industry that we we're talking about, the healthcare industry, the insurance companies, the gas companies, et cetera, uh, the oil companies, they give money to the national parties, which then funnel that money down to state candidates to help them win elections and then those people are more likely to respond to those special interests than they are to the interests of uh, you know, working Vermonters. So I would do uh, everything possible to re reignite that campaign reform effort in Vermont and try to make Vermont, again, a model for other states. You know, there's really no reason, I don't think, why somebody should have to spend millions of dollars to run for office in Vermont. We're not a very big state. Um, you know, someone like our current governor who's been in office ever since he got out of college, for Pete's sake. I mean, this guy's going to have to spend a million dollars to reintroduce himself to Vermonters. I mean, I don't understand why that becomes necessary. The reason, logic reason why it does is this side spends more money, so this side spends, so this, you know, and everybody's trying to keep up with everybody. And if you just put a lid on the whole thing and said, forget it, you know, we're not going to spend that much money, then others wouldn't have to do it as well. But if you're someone who has access to a lot of money and can run a million dollar or two million dollar campaign, you're going to do it. I mean, these folks, I'm not going to, these folks are going to do it um, because it's a way of scaring away your opponents and it's frankly a way of having to, of being able to avoid debate on real issues because you can just run your TV ads and your radio ads and, you know, use that money to do all kinds of things that allow you to move forward in a campaign without having to debate issues. If there was less money spent on campaigns, there would be more debates. And I think candidates should spend less time raising money and more time raising issues. And, um, you know, when we talk about the amount of money that gets spent on, you know, things, the gas, the health care, whatever, look at the amount of money that gets spent on elections. And, you know, while the cost of elections keeps going up, you know, candidates spend more and more money, I would venture to say that it's not because more and more people are giving big donations. You know, most people don't give anything to candidates. And most people who do give to candidates give very small amounts. The fact is there's a very small group of people and special interests who tend to give more and more money to, you know, to candidates. So you have this small group that is having more and more control over time on the political process. And, you know, it's just wrong because it discourages people from being a candidate as well as from participating. You know, you're going to run a... If you were to announce tomorrow that you were going to run for the U.S. Senate or U.S. Congress or governor, one of the first questions you'd have to respond to is, well, how much money could you raise, Terry? Not, oh, really, what are you going to do about health care? Or, you know, let's talk about prescription drugs. Or, you know, what are you going to do about affordable housing? 
The beginning of a campaign is often cloaked in, are you a credible candidate? Or can you raise money? Yeah, I want us to have more candidates, and that means, ironically, less money being spent so people don't feel intimidated about, uh, well, I can't run for office because I don't want to raise all that money. Raising money f in a campaign is not fun. It's a hard thing to do, and, and the average person clearly doesn't want to do it, and I don't blame them. So I think we need to have less money and, and more people in elections. It really means that we're not a democracy. Right. If, uh, if it costs $10 million to run for the Senate, only the rich can do that, so that makes us a plutocracy, yeah. ruled by the rich. I, I, when I lived in Sweden, I uh, studied a little of their history, and at one point the, uh, uh, the Swedish prime minister was a carpenter. and huh. he, he had no money, but he was supported by the party, and uh, it, it wasn't necessary to have money. Yeah. But uh, all of our leaders are lawyers and the uh, rich oil men and yeah. multimillionaires. And you look at the Congress, and there's a lot of millionaires in the Congress, or you look at our current president or, or even our former one between the Bush, Clinton, and Bush. I mean, you're talking, to, you know, it's clear that you've got some very wealthy families over the years who have been able to ascend to the presidency or families where, you know, you know, the father's in the U.S. Senate and then the son goes into the U.S. Senate. And, you know, part of that is name recognition for sure, but part of it is dynasties that, that uh, you know, find themselves in a position where they have the money to control those congressional seats or those Senate seats, and they actually have the money to then become leaders in contention for the presidency. And I'm not saying it's quite like that in Vermont. It's not. But we are getting to the point where it's harder and harder for regular people to run for office, even if it's a local office. So I think um, you know we need to do what we can to encourage, I think everybody watching the show should consider running for office. I really do. I think that it's a great experience that it's okay to even lose. It's better to win, obviously, but don't be afraid to do it and don't assume that people in elected office are smarter than you or have a better grasp on a lot of policy issues than you do. I think we have to bring regular people into the process so their experience can begin to shape the debate. And, you know, that's what I've done over the years and working with farmers and people with uh, kids with disabilities and others as you know workers who are losing their jobs I mean those voices are really important to me farmers who say well nobody in Montpelier listens to us anymore or people with disabilities who struggle to, to to speak but then can get up and give a speech because they become empowered or or workers who say you know I'm losing my job and I'm not gonna let this go without a fight those kind of voices have to be heard in Montpelier and whether it's as you know on uh, during an election or, or afterwards. I always say, you know, what happens on election day is very important, but we should not fool ourselves into thinking that just by casting a ballot or electing a new president or electing a new governor that the world changes overnight. What happens on election day is important, but what happens in between elections is even more important because that's when people should be speaking up and organizing and making sure that they are heard in this process. So. I'm an example of what you uh, are talking about. I just moved to Vermont uh, uh, three years ago. And last March, I uh, decided to run for ward clerk in Ward 3. And uh, I won the election. There so uh, now, <laughs> as a great. flatlander, I'm... Uh, <laughs> We're letting you participate, huh? Yes. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Yeah, because I think a lot of people are just, you know, they, they would like to be more involved, but they're not sure how to do it, or they feel like they somehow have to be an expert on something. And, that's really not the case. Well, Anthony, it's been very interesting talking to you, and I'm certainly going to vote for you. I want to thank you for well, coming today. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and also to talk to you with your viewers as well. I think this kind of uh, conversation, but also this kind of community access media is extremely important, and it has the potential to be one of those powerful forces in getting people connected again. So I do appreciate it. We have no wealthy sponsors that are controlling <laughs> what we have to say. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you again. Thank you.